Welcome to the Brady Marks podcast with your host, Brady Yashia from Brady Marks Buyers Advisory. Enjoy discussions with a variety of guests and pioneers from diverse backgrounds, each sharing their unique perspectives on property, business, industry, and more. Hi, I'm Brady, founder and CEO of Brady Marks Buyers Advisory. This week, we have a very special guest and an icon of the property industry, Leanne Pilkington. Leanne is the CEO of Lang & Simmons, former president of the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales, and current Deputy President of the Real Estate Institute of Australia. She's the chair of the Sister to Sister Foundation and founder of Real Woman in Real Estate. Welcome, Leanne. I love being an icon. Thank you so much for that. (laughs) You are. (laughs) It's such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. I know your time is valuable. Yeah. My first question to you is, how do you find the time to fit everything in? I get asked that a lot, as you can imagine. Um, To be honest, um, I don't say no to too much, which is not necessarily uh, good advice for anyone else to follow, but I I work most days, so I I just don't take a lot of time off. That's how I fit it in. Yes. Being in real estate, it's all about the 24-7. Totally. Yeah, we're all the same, right? (laughs) How did you first get started in real estate? So my dad was a real estate agent and I started answering the phone at his office as a 12-year-old. My brother and sister got into the business the same (laughs) way. Um, And then I was going to be a school teacher. So I was on um, schoolies uh, up on the Gold Coast, as you do, and uh, ran out of money and rang dad and he said, okay, I'll send you some money so long as you work for me until you go to university. Um, And so I did and um, I just kept on working. I didn't end up going to uni. I studied to become a valuer, um, which was three nights a week, (laughs) driving from Castle Hill (laughs) to the city three nights a week in the days before the M2. Um, And, yeah, that's how I I spent uh, about eight years working for Dad. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. So is it fair to say that real estate is in your blood? I think that is fair to say, yeah. I've been in real estate of one form or another my entire career with the exception of Three years as a recruiter um, back in the, gosh, in the 90s, early 90s. Wow. (laughs) So what lessons did you learn from your father? My dad, gosh. um, I learnt to do what you say you're going to do. I learnt to work hard. I was never allowed to have a sick day. Um, I can still remember I was about maybe 13 or 14 years old girlfriend's birthday party at Luna Park. Hello, (laughs) how exciting. And it was a Sunday and I was not allowed to go because I had to work. And so it was, there's just never any excuses from, for dad, you've just, work is the priority. So I guess the work ethic is probably the biggest thing that I got from both mum and dad. Yeah, it's fantastic. Good work ethic in the real estate arena goes a long way. Sure does. You've worked extensively with the Real Estate Institute both here in New South Wales and Australia, yep. raising professional standards of the real estate industry. Mm-hmm. You're very busy and pack a lot into your day and yep. life itself can get very hectic. Yep. How do you avoid burnout? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not really sure. I think I know myself well enough to know when I need to just take a break and, you know, go for a walk or Um, or do some exercise or have a massage, whatever it is that I feel like I need. I'm very self-aware, but I just have the capacity to work long and hard, to be frank. Um, But I think you do have to have that that self-awareness to know when it's time for you to do something for you. Yeah, when enough is enough to just take a bit of a breather. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I think we all need to do that. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. (laughs) You're very successful and a mentor to so many people. What is your best advice for someone looking to get into the real estate industry? I think you've got to be realistic about what to expect. Um, A lot of people see all the glitz and glamour that the real estate agents want to show you on whether it be on TV or on Instagram. Um, But behind it, it is a lot of hard work. And so you need to be realistic about that. Um, You need to understand your market really well. And you need to be prepared to make the phone calls. You can't hide behind social media or emails. Real estate is about relationships and so you've got to build those relationships because people um, buy and sell real estate through people they know, people they like and people they trust. And so it takes time to build that. Yes, I completely agree with you. Yeah. 
The real estate market is very interesting at the moment. There are so many micro markets. Mm -hmm. Sellers are sitting on the fence Mm -hmm. and buyers are confused. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone that's looking to buy or sell in the current climate? Yeah, I've never, I've been in real estate for 40 years and I've never seen a market like this. For prices to still be going up um, in the interest rate environment that we're in right now is incredibly unusual. I've not seen it before. Um, the best time to, to buy a property is when you find something that you love that you can afford. That's the best time to buy. And so the people that are trying to pick the market, I forget it. Experts can't pick the market. So the problem is that we only ever know the peak or the trough of the market three months later, right? Because that's the only yeah. way we can judge it. And so for people looking to sell, um, the, the the recommendation would be buy and sell in the same market. So it doesn't ma- matter if the market's high or low. If you're buying and selling in the same conditions, um, you know, you're, you're, you're getting it on, on one side or the other, yes. right? Um, and I just think people get too overly analytical about it. Mm-hmm. If, it if you're buying for somewhere to live, then buy it when you can afford it and you see something that you really like. Yeah, that's such great advice. Advocating for women in real estate Mm -hmm. is important to you and you've been instrumental in in establishing women in real estate. Mm -hmm. What do you think the future will bring for women in the industry? Yeah, I think um, it's really interesting times. I think women need to get really clear on um, what success means to them. You know, it's, this industry is always about the high transaction numbers and the high GCI and the, the you know, the European cars and all of that sort of stuff. But that might not be everyone's measure of success. And so if you're trying to work around a family or caring for parents or whatever it is, you may not be able to achieve that level of success and that's okay. You've got to be clear on what's important to you Mm -hmm. and then be prepared to do what it takes to achieve that. But I think real estate is an incredible industry for women and I'm frustrated that there's not more of us in it. Um, But it does get, it gets better. It gets better every year, I think. Yes, it definitely does. I've seen so many changes in all the years that I've been in real estate and um, I'm so passionate about it. Yeah, absolutely. On a personal note, sure, you have an amazing wardrobe. It's true, I do. (laughs) Do you have any styling tips for women in business? (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, I get a lot of people say, oh, I love I love what you're wearing, but I couldn't wear it. I mean, obviously you're all in black today, so I'm thinking you probably wouldn't choose to wear this outfit. Um, I was, when I was a recruiter, I was only ever allowed to wear black navy and, and beige, wasn't allowed to wear anything else. And then when I left that role, my wardrobe became an absolute rainbow. <laughs> and so my tip is wear what makes you feel good. Um, I don't feel myself if I wear um, black. I, I, in fact, gave away all of my black clothes. Um, so I wear what makes me feel good and what makes me smile. So I would recommend anybody else do the same thing. Yeah, that's great. You always look fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone loves a good quote. What is your favourite quote? Uh, I'm not one for favourites of anything, to be honest. I changed my mind, but my current favourite quote is it's not about what you've done, it's about what you do next. Because it doesn't matter, you know, I've got I've done a lot that I'm really proud of in my career, but that's all in the past. And it's what I focus on next that's really important. And it's the same for everybody. It doesn't matter if you've um, done a lot that you're proud of or that you're not proud of. It is like, you know, dust yourself off yeah. and focus on what's next. That's so yeah. good. I love it. Yeah, I love it too. So Leanne, you were involved in buying Lang and Simmons. Could mm-hmm. you please tell us the story behind that? Yeah, sure. I um, I started working at Lang and Simmons in 1995, and yes, I understand that a lot of people weren't even born then. Um, so it's a really long time to be working somewhere. Um, but something that I do with my corporate team every year is we write a letter to ourselves, um, and we write it in December to be read the following December. Um, in a and we write it in a way that we're saying that we've achieved all of the things that we want to achieve. So it's, it's kind of like a business plan by another name. And in 2019, I couldn't write that letter. And that was really unusual for me. I'm always, I'm a very optimistic person. I've always been, I had a really clear vision of the future and what the future looks like. And I just couldn't see the future. 
And I really, um, I really thought long and hard about it. I've got a, um, a beautiful friend called Tanja Lee, who's a coach in the real estate space. And I rang her, I'd been offered another business opportunity. And I rang her and said, look, I'm really struggling with this decision, which is something doesn't, I don't struggle with decisions very often. Um, I don't usually have to ask for other people's um, advice or assistance. And um, anyway, I spoke to Tange and um, I went right through this other opportunity and at the end of the call I just burst into tears, which is something that um, I never do. And I just went, you know what, I can't leave Lang & Simmons. I feel so responsible for the brand and the people within the brand. I can't leave. And so that being the case, what's next? And so I sat with that for a little bit and then in the end, in my letter to myself, I wrote, um, it's December 2020 and Lang and Simmons has new owners. And so then I had to ring the CEO and say, um, I think you need to sell the brand. You need to go to the board and you need to get them to sell the brand. And so as luck would have it, it was good timing for them as well and so that's what they did. And then the next problem was who who to buy it because I still was. I, it wasn't that I wanted to buy the brand myself at all. I just knew yeah. that it was time for these people to go and do other things and for us to have a new direction. And um, I was on the uh, um, I was president at the REI at the time and we were negotiating with a couple of really big brands to buy us and I was on the phone with one of the CEOs of those brands and he was shooting me. Oh, REI should do this. He was president, should do that. And I got off the phone and just went, bugger that, I'm not working for him. I cannot work for him. I'm too old. I was 58 by that stage. I'm too old to work for somebody like that. And so it's like, oh, now what? Now what do I do? Um, and I had a couple of franchisees who had heard that the rumour that we might be on the market because we hadn't told anybody at this uh, at this stage. And so I, I rang them and, um, and they said, look, Lee, if you're prepared to buy, have equity in the business, we're prepared to buy in with you. I'm thinking, I'm 58, do I really need to buy a business at this stage in my life, in my career and all that? So anyway, um, I decided that I would go out and, um, and see all of my um, franchisees and have a conversation with them, which is a really risky thing to do, right? Um, you don't kind of tell everybody there's a deal <laughs> happening before the deals happen, no. <laughs> right? Um, but I didn't want any of them to wake up tomorrow and, and find out that the brand had been sold to franchisees and they had no idea that it was happening. I just didn't want that. Um, so I went and saw everybody and to my shock, everyone kept on saying, wow, that's a great idea, can we buy in, can we buy in, can we buy in? And in the end I'm like, I don't have enough to sell. Um, so <laughs> some of the shareholders have only got really small shareholdings just by virtue of the fact that they were down the end of my list of people. Mm. Like I just saw them later than I saw some of the others. So that was kind of how it all came about. Crazy, right? But we are, we bought it 1st of April um, in 2021 we wow. settled. April Fool's Day. <laughs> yeah, that, that tells you all you need to know about my sense of humour. It could have, we could have done it on the 31st, but I, it had to be on the 1st. <gasps> what an incredible story. Yeah, thank you. So the Real Estate Institute of Australia, for those yep. listeners that don't understand what it is, um, has been a big part of your career. Sure. Uh, could you please tell us how you got involved? Absolutely. So the Real Estate Institute of Australia is the um, the, the peak body for real estate um, across the country and the members are um, basically the state um, the state institutes. Um, and we are the ones that lobby for any federal um, fe- federal rule changes. Okay. Um, things like you know negative gearing and tax changes that affect everybody. Um, there's a lot of conversations about rent caps at the moment. We need to educate um, those in government, those making decisions as to why a rent cap is actually not a good idea. Mm-hmm. We need to talk to them about supply and talk about different opportunities for um, freeing up supply. So that's the Real Estate Institute of Australia. Um, the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales is obviously a member of um, the Australian Institute and I was president there for four years. Um, I've been on the board since 2009 and 
I actually was tapped on the shoulder and asked if I would um, I would join the board and it had never occurred to me that my, I had a voice of value. Mm-hmm. I didn't think I could actually add any value at that level, which looking back is a bit sad. But um, one of the things that I decided to do when I did become president was to try and encourage other women to be the person that taps other women on the shoulder to join the board. So now the board is um, the gender diversity is is pretty much 50 50 uh, on the board, and there's a lot of um, it. It's incredibly important to have a strong institute because without it, the legislation that we all have to work um, within would be so much more onerous than it already is. I think people would be really shocked to know at some of the suggestions mm. that come across our desk and um, and we have to very quickly go back to saying, no, this won't work for these reasons. So it's very, it's um, it's a very, very important role that the institutes play. Yeah. Well, thank you for everything that you do. We all truly appreciate it. My pleasure. And your charity that you chair, the Sister, yep. to Sister Foundation, what is it and how can people get involved if they want to help or donate some money? Yeah, um, so Sister to Sister, I've been involved since 2009 and basically it's a mentoring program for for um, troubled and at-risk teenaged girls and we have got really experienced trauma-informed um, counsellors and um, people involved. So it's a very unique program. Basically we have um, one-on-one big sisters, uh, so you spend time together with your little sister. They're between 12 and 17 uh, years of age They've had really challenging um, things happen to them in their short lives, and it's just a it's just to give them a positive role model that they probably have never had before, and to give them an environment where they don't feel like they're different. Mm-hmm. They see people like them, so we definitely um, need funding. Um, I was asked to to chair only this year, so I've been a team leader or a big sister since two thousand and nine. And I was appointed chair only a couple of months ago. And one of the things that we are, um, are doing is um, putting together some I- events that people can get involved with. Um, we've got a Fabulous Women I Know lunch happening in October. Yeah. Um, so I will definitely send you an invitation to Please that. Please do. Um, and, um, yeah, so uh, if anybody is interested in um, finding out more about the organisation, I'm happy for them just to reach out to me on on Instagram or over email, I'm not very hard to find. Um, I, I would love to talk more about the charity and how people can get involved. Thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to have you. If someone wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, so either on um, LinkedIn, it's Leanne Pilkington, or Instagram, the Leanne Pilkington. Um, I'm very diligent at responding to my messages, so I would love to hear from people. Great. Thank Thank you. you. You're welcome.